Um, we interrupt your regular broadcast of preaching on the book of Mark, as Simon says, to bring you this announcement. It is Father's Day. And to celebrate my favorite Christian dad joke. The Lord said to John, come forth and receive eternal life. But John came fifth and won a toaster. <laughs> Do you like that one, Dewey? You're going to be hearing it a lot. <laughs> Today is a day to celebrate all of the father figures in our lives, terrible jokes and all. And we go to great lengths to ensure that as many people as possible are able to celebrate today. We tell people it's not just about biological fathers, but it's about stepfathers, adoptive father, grandfather, or other male relatives you might have stepped in to fill the role. We even sometimes say, hey, take a moment to appreciate your spiritual fathers in the faith. But today, I think the most important father to celebrate is your heavenly father. Yeah. Jesus taught us to pray, our father who is in heaven. He said he only did what he saw the father doing. He demonstrated to us that when we relate to God, we relate to him first and foremost as a father. Now, I've been a dad for precisely 966 days, but who's counting? That's roughly two years and eight months. And since I became father, I'll be honest, my time at the start and the end of my day for reading the Word, spending time with God, has been a little bit squashed, you know, by responsibilities at the start of the day with the kids, and at the end of the day, I just collapse in a heap. <laughs> um, so in this season of my life, uh, I do things a little bit differently. I, I find I'm listening to God more throughout the day, um, and that he's speaking to me through things that are going on. Um, as opposed to in discrete chunks at the start, at the end of the day. That's just the season I'm in, I'm in at the moment. And given that the majority of my spare time is spent dadding, it's natural then that God speaks to me through my experiences with my children. Yeah. I'm finding that because I now have lived experience of being a father, it's given me fresh insight into God's character and the way that he sees me and feels about me. And that has in turn given me new insight into my own identity and my relationship with him. And one of my favorite things about getting to know God is that whenever you discover something new about him, you discover something new about yourself. Amen? Amen? So this morning, I'm going to be sharing some of my adventures in... First one, please. <laughs> I'm in control. There we go. Uh, I'm going to be sharing some of my adventures in parenting with you. I'm going to be sharing what God has said to me through those experiences. And I'm going to be speaking those things over your life too. Because the Bible says that when you give your life to Jesus, when you put him in charge of your life, you become adopted by God. You're his child too. And so anything that God has revealed to me about my father-son relationship with him is also true of you as well. So I'm going to be speaking those things over you today. So Alex, I hear you say, why do you need a baby strapped to your chest to do that? <laughs> Did you lose a bet? No. Did you just fancy the challenge? Maybe. Are you going to use the baby as a visual aid? Absolutely yes. <laughs> but Alex, isn't that a lot of pressure to put on a baby? Yes, it is. <laughs> and this could very well go spectacularly wrong, at least in as many ways as there are for this chap to expel fluids over me. But I trust my son, and mummy is on standby. Um, <laughs> God doesn't behave too dissimilarly with us. If you compare your abilities to God the Father's, by comparison, it's like you're a mostly helpless baby, and he's a fully grown adult who's taking care of you. And yet the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that God has prepared good works in advance for you to do. In fact, not a chapter later, it then follows that up and says, God is super abundantly able to do far more above anything you could ever dream or imagine. Now, hang on a second, God. <laughs> You're the one who can do anything and everything above and beyond what I can imagine. Why on earth are you leaving any of it to me? <laughs> you, you, could, you could do it so much better than me. I'm like a baby compared to you. The fact that he gives me any part in carrying out of his will on this earth is staggering. But God knows that, and he trusts me anyway. And in the same way that I'm giving nine-month-old Dewey a role to play today, God, your father, has a role for you to play. Everything that he has lined up for you to do, he could accomplish entirely on his own if he wanted to. But he doesn't want that. He wants to involve you. Yeah. He entrusts those things to you because he feels he can trust you. And he doesn't just leave you to do those things by yourself. I've not rocked up here and just dumped Derry on the stage today and let him get on with it. <laughs> but I'm supporting him, literally, 
to play his part. Without me, he can't play his part. And it's the same for you. God, your Father, will always be right there with you, supporting you and empowering you to do everything that he has called you to do. Amen? So as you go about what God has given you to do, rely on him. Don't try to do anything without him. God wants to partner with you, to do it all with you, so that you might spend more time with him and grow closer to him. So let's get started. God the Father, speaking from experience. The first part of my parenting experiences that I want to talk to you about, you're seeing right now. As a parent, you do learn to do a lot of things (laughs) one-handed. But it's super awkward because babies are very unpredictable, and they do just like to throw themselves in any certain direction uh, at any point randomly. (laughs) So to make life easier for ourselves, we got this carrier. Um, And honestly, it's been one of the best uses of 20 pounds in my life. Not only does it make sure my son stays securely in place where I can see him, it also frees up my hands so I can do jobs more easily. And when Debbie is in the carrier, he is, as you can see, content. The only reason he will cry now is if he wants a feed or a change. So this is an incredibly reliable way of keeping him calm. But why does this make him content? The reason that he is content is because he is close to me, because he feels a certain sense of security, of safety, of peace when he is near me. So much so that he often falls asleep in the carrier. When he is near to me, he feels safe, he feels loved. He finds rest. It even works if he's in pain. He started to crawl, and he's learning to like, stand at the moment, pull himself, on stuff, uh, pull himself up on stuff and cruise around. Um, and so naturally, sometimes he puts a foot wrong, he falls over, he takes a knock somehow. And when that happens, he'll cry. But what comforts him in that moment is being picked up and held. When he's hurt, being close to me gives him the comfort that he needs. And it's the same for you and I with our Heavenly Father. When God is your heavenly father, you always have someone to go to. And when you get close to the father, you feel safe. When something happens in life that causes you pain, go to the father. If you're upset or worried for any reason, go to the father. There was a guy in the Bible called David, greatest king that ever lived, not counting Jesus. And that was how he lived. In every trial and triumph of his life, he would let his emotions carry him into the presence of God. And this is what he says about God in Psalm uh, 91, verses 1 and 2. It says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He talks about God as a fortress, a big, strong, secure building that you can shut yourself away in if you ever need to feel safe. The funny thing about a fortress is that in order to benefit from it, you've got to get close to it, right? Uh, I can't be made safe by the fortress if I'm nowhere near the fortress. That's what I want to encourage you to do this morning. Get close to your father. Whenever you have trouble, go to God with it. Find safety and rest in him. Find security in him. For those of you that are practically minded, you might be asking in your head, right, well, how, Alex, how, Alex, do I do that? Um, And the answer is this, it's to pray, which is just a fancy word for talking to God. I want to demystify prayer for people that think it's a bit strange. Uh, Praying is just as natural as talking to your father. And if you've never tried it before, let me assure you, God hears every word and he will always answer you. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 says, call to me and I will answer you. That's a promise from you, from, from God to you. And he won't break it. So, let's go back to my son. Uh, have a look at him. What do you think he's thinking right now? Pro- probably something along the lines of, ooh, faces. Or, I'm going to fill my pants, and then I'm going to crawl away whilst that is going to change me. <laughs> he, he, he is always wriggling around, uh, trying to get away from me. I uh, swear it's his evil scheme. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's low odds that we can actually guess what he's thinking right now. Um, But we can take a very, very well-educated guess at what he isn't thinking. I am 99.9% sure, and I only leave the 0.1% off because I can't prove it, I'm 99% sure that Dewey isn't worrying at the moment. 
I'm pretty confident that he's not worried, for instance, about, mm, there we go, his next meal. I mean, sure, he will cry when he's hungry, but he does that because it's the only way he knows how to ask for food. He knows who to ask, and he knows to keep on asking until he gets it. He is totally sure that we have it, and he expects wholeheartedly to receive it from us. He also has more needs than he probably understands yet, but they are provided for. He has clothes when he needs them. He has a roof over his head where he is warm and looked after by two parents that between them bring enough home to see that all of those things are provided. He isn't worried about these things in the slightest. Recently, Lois and I renewed our mortgage for the first time. Those of you in a similar position, um, and those of you keeping up with the news, know that it's not a particularly fun time to be renewing your mortgage at the moment, especially on top of all the cost of living stuff that we've all been enduring for the past year and a bit. But there were a good few days where I actually really spent too much time thinking about it and worrying about it, even. And on those days, on one of those days, we took Ammon and Derry to the park, and I just watched them having fun on the swings and being joyful just getting on with being kids. They were just so joyful and happy and smiley, and it occurred to me they have absolutely no clue about the mortgage stuff. Probably a bit of an obvious statement to make, <laughs> but I saw them playing, and God just really impressed on me that my children just get on, on with their lives, happy and content in the knowledge that we will always give them everything they need. And God challenged me. He said, Alex, it's the same with me and you. <laughs> You can just get on with your life happy and content in the knowledge that I will always provide everything that you need. And since God had that conversation with me, I have felt so much better about the whole thing. I know that even though we are adults who very much have to live our lives aware of such things as mortgages and price rises and all those other things that we have to be aware of to, to run our households, in the same way that my son knows I will always have food for him, we know that our Father in heaven will always look after us, yeah. financially, materially, in every need. Yeah. And when things get tough or tight, all we need to do is remember that, and we find hope, which is something that a lot of people sorely need right now, isn't it? There are so many people walking through the cost of living crisis, and they, they don't know that God the Father is looking after their needs. I want to read to you one of my favorite portions of scripture. So I'll just get these up on the slides there. Um, so Matthew 6, verse 25 to 33, um, it says, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. God will provide your every need. And whenever you're in danger of forgetting that, just come back to this scripture. And let it remind you to trust the Father with your needs. Give every worry you have to God. Now then, back to my boy one more time. My son Dewey is incredibly intelligent. At eight months old, he is already categorizing things. Everything he comes across, he picks up and thoughtfully contemplates, and then sorts it into one of two categories. These are food and not food. And he knows of only one way to ascertain this information. 
He's at the age where he wants to pick up everything, and he wants to put it all in his mouth. I'm not just talking toys. I'm talking the TV remote, my phone, fingers, not his, grass, my kneecap, cat biscuits. <laughs> that, that last one actually is food, depending on your standards. Um, <laughs> but just to clarify, he is yet to succeed in actually getting them into his mouth. But it's only a matter of time. Um, you name it, he wants to know if it's food. It's a whole thing. Recently, Lewis and I have started attempting beach trips with both the children in, in tow. And uh, sounds lovely, doesn't it? Young family going, going on little beach adventures. And when behaves very much as though she has been taken to a beach. She'll collect shells in a bucket. She'll try to build a sandcastle. She'll maybe even fly a kite. This guy, on the other hand, thinks he's been taken to a buffet. <laughs> shells, rocks, sand. He just gets covered in sand. And it's all over him. It's in his mouth. Now, personally, I hate sand. It's coarse and it gets everywhere. So, <laughs> so when we get home from the beach, there is only one thing for it, and that's the shower. <laughs> not, not even a nice gentle bath. No, I need to hose this child down. <laughs> but can you imagine if we got home and we just left him in this state? Just leave him, you know, the rest of the day, let him have his dinner, put him to bed, and leave him just covered in sand. I, I can tell that idea doesn't you know, sit tremendously well with a lot of people in the room. No, you don't put him to bed like that. You've got to make him clean, haven't you? Isn't it funny how we have this inbuilt desire for our, our children to be clean? And we teach them to be clean. And when, they see, when, when we see that they can't keep themselves clean, or clean themselves, we can't help but clean them, right? I'm constantly like wiping food off of faces and things like that. And God's shown me that he has the same heart towards us. No father wants their kids to live their lives dirty. No father who has it in their power to clean their children when they can't or won't clean themselves will sit idly by yeah, and let them go on being unclean. In the same way that we take action to help our children where they are unable to help themselves, God the Father makes us clean. In life, we make choices, don't we? And sometimes those choices are mistakes. We can wrong people. We can wrong ourselves. We can wrong God. Sometimes we're unaware that the choices we've made were mistakes, and other times we're well aware and we do them anyway. But either way, those choices, they, they cling to our souls like dirt. And you might remember things that you've done in the past, and you might feel regret, guilt, shame even. And try as though you might, you can't shape them. Did you know there's a father who wants you to be free of those things. There's a father who wants to clean those things off of you. So you can be free to live your life unburdened by your past. Now, if you've ever tried to clean a child, you'll know there are two types of children in that situation, aren't there? There are those who will very happily let us do the cleaning, and then there are those who resist. <laughs> in the past, there have been times where I've said to Amwen, bath time, Amwen, and she legs it. <laughs> and I can catch her, but if I don't also convince her to, to let me wash her, then bath time can be nigh on impossible. Uh, and everyone here who has ever tried to force a child to, uh, to, to, to force bath, bath time on a child, they'll know it doesn't exactly go well for your eardrums. <laughs> it doesn't exactly go well for your relationship with the child either. What I'm saying is that in order to be made clean, my child ultimately needs to submit themselves to my will. They need to come to a place where they think, I'm going to let my father clean me. It could be a very similar situation with us. When we need God to make us clean, our reaction can sometimes be to run from him. And indeed, some people spend their entire lives running from God. Even Christians can pick up an unclean way of living, and instead of going to him to be made clean, they just hold on to it and run. I want to encourage you today not to run away from God. I want to encourage you to run to him. If you know your life doesn't meet God's standards, if you're someone who has lived differently to the way that you know in your heart that God wants you to live, and you want to do something about it and be free of the guilt and the shame and the regret that your choices have brought on you, today you can stop running from him. You can let him make you clean. Well, how do I do that, Alex? Good question. Um, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, But you were cleansed. You were made holy. 
You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Calling on the name of Jesus. How do I do that? Glad you asked. Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. To say Jesus is Lord simply means this. Jesus, I'm putting you in charge. I'm not going to live my own way anymore. If you say that and mean it, and if you believe Jesus died to pay the price for your mistakes and was raised to life again by God, the guilt, you're free of the shame, you're free of the regret, and you can walk out of here a changed person into a changed life with God, your Father. Just to finish then, I want you to have a think about what's been said today. What do you need from the Father today? You might have been listening and, and thought at any given point, man, I really wish I had that or, feel, or could feel that or could know that to be true in my own heart. You may need security today. I want to encourage you, be close with God your Father. You may need provision today for a need. Bring your needs to God your Father. You may need to feel a sense of freedom right now. Freedom from your past. Run towards your Father this morning.